So hello and welcome to the Writing Lab. I guess you would call this a podcast. Um, I'm joined by Mr. Short. Good morning, hello. Mr. Short. Hello. Good morning. And we're going to take a look at Julius Caesar. So it really would be helpful for you to have your book in front of you as you go through this, um, because we will be looking at specific speeches. So let's go ahead and take a look at um, the focus of this play. Why did we have you read this play? And I think this play has been studied for so long because of its, well, just the, the persuasiveness of the speakers in this. I mean, how do you get somebody to commit murder? And it's how do you commit someone that you're right in this? So this is all about rhetoric. And so here's here's kind of what we're looking at. Whenever you have a situation, it's known as the kairos. This is the environment where the argument takes place. So in the case of Julius Caesar, we know that um, Rome has really established itself as an empire and it has control of, of many other places, other countries, a lot of that having to do with Julius Caesar's uh, military prowess and the Roman people are are very excited and and obviously when you have a victory like this it it creates a lot of emotions and so this is what's known as the Kairos it's just the situation in which everything takes place within that you have three different um, systems that you used kind of convince a person of something. The first one is logos, and that's just the facts that are presented, things that people know, you know, the sun will come up in the east and it will set in the west. People know this. It makes sense. It's logical. Another thing that we look at is pathos, and this has to do with people's emotions. Now, the one thing about pathos is that it's very temporary. And so, um, Mr. Short, I'm sure you've seen, do, do you ever watch those SPCA commercials when they come on? I have seen them before. I, I don't, I don't really watch TV anymore, but yeah. Yeah. And the, well, the first thing I do is once I hear just the opening bars of any Sarah McLaughlin song, <laughs> I usually turn the channel. Um, the reason for that is they know that they can get you, your emotions are temporary. And so if you can watch these poor suffering animals, you're most likely to reach for your wallet or your purse and get some money out, get your credit card out and donate. The problem is if you need to go to the bathroom and you would say, okay, I'll do it after I get back from the bathroom. And then you come back and you think, what was I gonna do? I forgot what I was gonna do because it's that temporary. So you have to kind of be careful with pathos. The other one is ethos, and that is the authority by which you have to speak. Now, if you yourself don't have the authority, then you go and you find people who do. These are usually the scientists, the doctors, the, the people who have the knowledge um, to explain the situation as it is. So we're going to be taking a look at how all three of these are used within the Kairos or the situation of Julius Caesar. So let's begin with the first uh, question. The first domino to fall that leads to the downfall of Brutus is how he is initially swayed by Cassius. Look carefully at the dialogue between these two characters in Act 1. How is Cassius able to persuade Brutus into conspiring against Caesar? What specific rhetorical devices does he use? What does Cassius know about his audience, namely Brutus, so that he can appeal to him? And so let's, if we go to page 726 in Act 1, let's see how this all, or 762, I'm sorry, 762. See how this all transpires. Um, Mr. Short, would you like to do a little reading with me? Sure. Okay, so would you like to be Cassius or Brutus? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're too nice to be a Cassius. I'll be a Cassius. If we, okay. if we start about line 25 and then maybe go to like 63. So if you be 
Brutus, I'll be Cassius. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Will you go see the order of the course? Not I. I pray you do. I am not gamesome. I do lack some part of that quick spirit that is in Antony. Let me not hinder Cassius your desires. I'll leave you. Brutus, I do observe you now of late. I have not from your eyes that gentleness of sh and show of love as I want to have. You bear too stubborn and too strange a hand over your friend that loves you. Cassius, be not deceived. If I have veiled my look, I turn the trouble of my countenance merely upon myself. Vexed I am of late with passions of some difference, conceptions only proper to myself, which give some soil perhaps to my behaviors. But let not therefore my good friends be grieved, among which number Cassius be you one, nor construe any farther, further my neglect than that poor Brutus with himself at war forgets the show of love to other men, shows of love to other men. Then Brutus, I have much mistook your passion, by means whereof this breast of mine hath buried thoughts of great value, worthy cogitations. Tell me, good Brutus, can you see your face? No, Cassius, for the eye sees not itself, but by reflection, by some other things. "'Tis just, and it is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have so much mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your eye, that you might see your shadow. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus, and groaning underneath this age's yoke, have wished that noble Brutus had his eyes. "'Into what dangers would you lead me, Cassius, that you would have me seek into myself?' for that which is not in me. Okay, and then from there on, Cassius is going to go through, and he's basically, from what I see in this, is that he's really trying to boost Brutus's own ego. W would you say that that's what's happening here? Yeah, absolutely. Because he's, um, the, the, he's trying to get the, Brutus to understand that other people respect him and know that he is uh, uh, he has, he is a man with integrity, and it's kind of hard to tell what um, it's kind of hard. Excuse me a second, Miss Wilkins. Shh. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, what it's looking like is that yeah, you know, Brutus is is I think he's kind of tired almost i mean do you get the sense that maybe he was part of this victory that rome had had um gotten at this point um you mean the victory of of caesar over his enemy yes oh was, yeah i think brutus may have been I, part of that i don't i'm not quite sure yeah i don't know but um but but Brutus is this kind of character who's very internalized, you know, mm -hmm. and and we can kind of almost read him like a book because his expressions are on his face, as as Portia points out when she says something's wrong with you, tell me what it is, and mm -hmm. he won't tell her, you know. Yeah. So so he's very much unlike Cassius, right? Cassius is kind of. Uh, a demon of sorts, but, yes. but Brutus is a different sort of character than that. He is, he's more self-reflective and a better character, I'd say. Right. And I think this is the very thing that, that Cassius is counting on with Brutus. It's almost like he knows that this is the way Brutus is going to respond. And um, it's, it's kind of unusual to, to, think that Brutus would be someone who could be egotistic, you know, that it, from the way he sounds, it doesn't, but the more you cut, he, he, the more he is convinced, you kind of wonder if he isn't buried deep down, hey, I am a better leader than Caesar. And I think, you know, maybe that's part of what Cassius is trying to look for in him. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So, um, 
we did this. We looked at so what is Cassie's telling Brutus? And what I'm what I'm seeing is that Cassius is telling Brutus, you know, the the people of Rome uh, have a lot of respect for you. Um, specifically, looking on 763 in lines 30. Six, well, 37. Your hidden worthiness into your eye that I might see your shadow. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus. So he's, he's definitely showing here that, um, hey, Brutus, you, you probably don't realize how people are speaking about you, but they really respect you. So what is his motivation to do this? What, uh, why is Cassius doing this to begin with? Do we have any indication as to why Cassius is approaching Brutus, why this all comes about? Well, Cassius uh, basically hates Caesar mm -hmm. and uh, wants to do anything he can to undermine Caesar. Yeah. And I don't see if there's any legitimate reason other than I just don't like Caesar. We want him out. You, you know, uh, some, of, some of Shakespeare's characters are like that. Like, for example, in Othello, there's no real good reason as to why Iago hates Othello. Mm -hmm. but, but he does. And he's sometimes described as being evil incarnate. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I kind of get that impression about Cassius here, too. That's a good point. Yeah, because I see the same thing going on between Anthony and Shylock in The Merchant of Venice. Same kind of thing. Um, but in, yeah. that, in that instance, Shylock is supposedly the devil. But uh, that's another play and another story. Yeah. Uh, now, the other thing that's interesting is that throughout the, the this inter... This, interchange between Cassius and Brutus is the crowds roaring. So if, uh, let's see, it was the first time that he hears it, it would be um, the very top of page 764. So, uh, and, he, and he's still buttering him up. Cassius says I, that I do fawn on men and hug them hard and after scandal them. Or if you know that I profess myself in banqueting to all the rout, then hold me dangerous. Well, believe me, we will. And then they hear this big shout from the crowd. And Brutus says, what does this, sh what means this shouting? I do fear the people choose Caesar for their king. Why should that bother Brutus? Brutus is uh, a character who um, is concerned about Rome. Mm -hmm. And uh, on top of that, he's also a character who um, doesn't have any faith that Caesar will be a good king. Mm -hmm. And so his motivations are almost noble. Right. Be because with it, when one person is in charge, that's when there's a real fear of a dictatorship. And the Senate, of which both Cassius and, and Brutus are part of, um, they they kind of have an equal footing to Caesar, maybe not in terms of the, he, Caesar is the leader, but these are his trusted advisors, kind of, and in, in, I believe that this, under this governmental system is kind of what we base our own government system on. So you can, you can basically call these men the cabinet, I guess you would say, right? Um, but so, so he hears this and Cassie's immediate reply, I, do you fear it? Then must I think you would not have it so? So he knows he's got him. I, I see this line as being, I hooked him. And then we, yeah. we see that flourish again at the end of the very long speech from Cassius. Uh, so get the start of the majestic world and hear the poem alone. Um, 
then then he hears again another general shout. I do believe that these applauses are for some new honors that are heaped on Caesar. So he's now he's convinced himself that this is what is going on. Um, why do you think this happens off stage? Um, there's a lot of things that you know. We know that Shakespeare was limited in how many actors he had and 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 setting and whatnot. But do you get the feeling that there's a there's a reason why this is going on off stage? Yeah, I, I think uh, a lot of it has to do with the idea that Shakespeare wanted us to imagine that there is a huge throng of people mm -hmm. um, that he couldn't possibly reproduce on stage that are making these shouts and flourishes, you know? Right. Also, I think it is purposeful in when Casca comes, because Casca is going to come in a little bit um, on page 768. Uh, this is after the crowd has dispersed. And so now they're getting the report from Casca about, well, what happened? What was going on? And so Casca's, he gives them the, uh, if we go to page 768 at line 220, Casca says, why there was a crown offered him and being offered him, he put it by with the back of his hand thus, and then the people fell a shouting. And then what was the second noise Audio. for? Oh, yeah. you're back. Oh, sorry. Did I accidentally mute myself? Okay. Yeah, you did. Thank you. Sorry about that. So, um, Kask is reporting that he was offered the crown, but Caesar just kind of brushed it off with the back of his hand. And then the people fell a shouting. And they were, well, what about the second shout? Same thing. They shouted thrice. What was the last cry for? Why for that too? So the crown was offered him three times. And yeah, that's basically what it is. So, can we trust Casca in this report? I think so. I do too. We don't have any, uh, un there's no motivation as to why he would, you know, report something different or, or this really is unusual. If, if Caesar was offered to be a king three times and three times, no, I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. Um, why lie about that? So... Okay, let's take a look at another one, 764, lines 90 to 131. This is Cassius's speech. Uh, so how is Cassius describing Caesar? So the, the previous speech was how the people respected Brutus, but if you look through this speech, what are some things that you notice how Cassius is describing Caesar to Brutus. Maybe if we go down to um, 100. For once upon a raw and gusty day, the troubled Tiber chasing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Darest thou, Cassius, now leap in with me into this angry flood and swim to yonder point? Upon the word accounted, account, uh, accoutered, accoutered as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow, so indeed he did. The torrent roared, and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive, the point purposed, per, oh, I'm sorry, proposed, Caesar cried, help me, Cassius, or I sink. What is the purpose of telling this story? What's going on in this little memory that Cassius has of Caesar? Cassius reviles the idea that Caesar is being treated like a god. Mm -hmm. And here he's trying to humanize Caesar to Brutus, saying, you know, um, one time Caesar needed me to save his life, and I did. And now, you know, at that point in time, he was weaker than I was myself. But now he's being hailed as a god. How do you like that? Yeah. And, and of course, Brutus is, and Brutus, I think in this whole 
aspect. And the, the one thing about Shakespeare plays is that we really don't know what the other character's thinking. We have to kind of infer that. But I would think that Brutus is just kind of internalizing all of this so that he would at some point say, you know what, maybe this Caesar isn't who we think he is. And then we've got the second flourish coming in and, and now he's starting to really get worried. Um, and it, this is exactly what Cassie is, this is expecting when she thinks so. Yeah. Yeah, and this is, this is why this play is studied the way it is because you have to know your audience. You have to know how your audience thinks, what your audience feels, and you use that to your advantage. And so I, I would think that Cassius understands Brutus to be, uh, you know, very devoted to Rome, not necessarily to Caesar, but he certainly understands that Rome would crumble under a dictatorship or an emperor. emperor. Um, and so he... Cassius kind of feeds on that, I would think. Yeah, he uses it to his advantage. Yeah. Um, and there, there, we won't do too many of these speeches. I just, in fact, let's go ahead and skip this one. Um, so the evidence Cassius is bringing up to Brutus, we just discussed one of those, the, 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 the story that he's more human and he needed somebody to rescue him so he can't be treated as a god like he is now. Um, and he expects this kind of fear of the dismantling of Rome. Um, now it's interesting, what authority does Cassius invoke as he speaks to Caesar? And I'm looking specifically at lines 139 to 141. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that are the underlings. What do you make of that little passage? Yeah, he's, he's saying that... Um... It's their own fault that they're underlings, mm -hmm. that, that they, they don't have to be. There's no reason that they need to be and that they can change their fates. Right. Because at the time, at least for Shakespeare's audience, maybe not necessarily, I don't know, maybe even during the, this, uh, there was still this this knowledge that gods controlled everything. And so that there, it wasn't their own destinies that they had control of, that the gods did or the stars did. And by the way, this is where John Green gets his title, The Fault in Our Stars. So um, in case you were wondering, this is known as an illusion in that title. So um, it is kind of... Uh, and this was another thing Shakespeare did, too, that I noticed. Um, Hamlet as well, Romeo and Juliet, where you're not quite sure if the stars really guide people's destinies or if it's the person themselves that sets up their destiny. Cassius obviously believes that it is themselves rather than the stars. But I think we're going to see a little bit later on that Brutus is thinking... Uh oh, <laughs> the stars aren't happy. Um, okay, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at Brutus now on page 787. Brutus is, uh, Cassius has convinced Brutus that Caesar needs to go. So now Brutus needs to convince the other council members that action is necessary. How is he going to do that? Um, let's look at the monologue starting at line 114. Listen for how Brutus is going to persuade the other sen senators to, enjoy, to join him in the conspiracy. No, not an oath. If not the face of men, the, the sufferance of our souls, the time's abuse, if these be motives weak, break off betimes, 
and every man hints to his idle bed. So let high-sided tyranny range on till each man drop by lottery. But if these, as I am sure they do, bear fire enough to kindle the cowards and to steal with valor the melting spirits of women, then countrymen, then countrymen, what need we any spur but our own cause to prick us to redress? What other bond than secret Romans that have spoke the word and will not palter? And what other oath than honesty to honesty engaged shall this be, or we will fall for it? Swear priests and cowards and men caudalous, old feeble carrions and such suffering souls that welcome wrongs unto bad causes swear, such creatures as men doubt, but do not stain the even virtue of our enterprise nor in the unsuppressive metal of our spirits, nor, nor the insuppressive metal of our spirits to think that our cause or our performance did need an oath, where every drop of blood that every Roman bears and nobly bears is guilty of several bastardy. If he do break the smallest particle of any promise that hath passed from him. Okay. So it it sounds like, you know, that Cassius had, what started all this was Cassius wanted them to make the oath that they were in agreement for this. But it seems to me that Brutus is saying we don't need an oath. Why don't they need an oath? Um, I think he's really looking at this is for the good of Rome. Why would we need an oath if this if this will benefit Rome. Um, what do you think about this one? Yeah, I think I, I agree with you on that. And I, I also think that um, Brutus kind of wants to have his cake and eat it too. <laughs> he, he wants to be a conspirator, but he doesn't want to think of himself as a conspirator. Mm -hmm. And so conspirators take oaths and mm -hmm. he doesn't want to do that because he wants to keep his, his conscience clear. Right. Yeah. He does uh, talk about a, a wimp. <laughs> he doesn't, he, this, this requires a specific um, decision. I would think that, that, um, I don't know. Brutus seems to be the he. It's like he's taken over this now, and Brutus is actually behaving the way he expected Caesar to behave. Would oh, you, that's a great point. Because it's like you know, this is for the good of Rome. We don't need an oath because this is for the good of Rome, and so that's how he's convincing the other council members. Um, and I'm wondering if that the old feeble carry-ons and the uh, suffering souls and, and, you know, we're not those men. We are men who, uh, for the good of Rome, are going to take out Caesar. That sounds very dictatorial to me. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how Brutus does take over, like you said. Mm -hmm. You know, Cassius brings this to his attention and then Brutus takes over. Yeah. So... Um, and what he does is he then preys upon the nobility of the other senators so that they too will feel that this needs to be done. Okay, page 786, um, before the, uh, it's when the, the, the senators come in and there's this conversation that happens well first there's Brutus and Cassius welcoming them and then there's another conversation going on and there it says under 100 they whisper now this is kind of tricky to figure out so it sounds like they're conspiring something while the pleasantries are going on between Decius and Casca and Cinna um, what do you think they're whispering about Yeah, perhaps they're whispering about what their 
what their plan might be. Mm -hmm. I think it also really emphasizes that they are indeed conspirators. Um, because when you conspire, I, literally the, the word means to, to breathe with someone else, right? And so um, they, we know now that it is a plot. It's sneaky. It's, you know, if there's something that's secretive, then there's something not right about what's going on. Okay. Now, is there any evidence that Rome was in danger if Caesar accepted the crown as king? And if so, what? No, there's no evidence. None at all. None at all. Unless you look, unless you look at the historical Caesar, who was not quite as good as the fictional Caesar in this play. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe all Caesars kind of had their, I mean, they were not good people. I'm not yeah. sure in the rundown, I know that Caligula was the worst one. <laughs> um, yeah. He was awful. Uh, Claudius wasn't so bad. But, you know, we're talking about these are the same people who were in charge at the time that, that, that Christ walked the earth. And, and it was the Romans who were in charge of the Jewish settlements in Israel. And um, Nero is the one that wipes most of them out. So and all of them, in fact, that's what a Caesar is. It's, it's not a name, really. It's a position. And so. Claudius Caesar, Caligula Caesar, Caesar Caligula, I guess they reverse them. I don't know. But um, yeah, and I, I, I don't know how much history that Shakespeare was into at that point. I, sometimes I wonder if Shakespeare wasn't kind of very liberal in his belief system. I do know that he respected Queen Elizabeth a lot, but there's some evidence that he kind of thumbs her no his nose at her sometimes. You know, I don't, I don't know if you've seen that in any of the plays, but um, I don't know. It just seems like Shakespeare wanted people to think about leadership and what's right and what's wrong. So, yeah, I, I can never find any evidence, at least in the play. Um, but we do know that he conquered a lot of places and, you know, those are wars that are, if, if you want land, you just come in and take it. And that's kind of what he did. Okay, so here's what the writing task is. Julius Caesar, a play about statehood and leadership, is one of the most quoted Shakespeare plays in modern day political speeches. Politicians have learned valuable lessons from studying the voices of rhetoric in this play. Choose any one of the speeches by one of the main characters from Julius Caesar. Write an essay in which you discuss the rhetorical strategies, ethos, pathos, and logos used in the speech. How did the speaker persuade his or her audience? What can modern speakers learn about the rhetoric from this speech? So um, what, what the prompt is really asking is kind of what we've discussed all along. How does the speaker persuade? What's the situation they're in? Kairos. What ethos, pathos, logos do they want to employ with that? Um, remember that the three ethos is the expertise or authority. This is, um, and this can be even like the stars. You know, the stars determine something that could be considered ethos because they're the ones in control. They are the ones that know. Pathos is emotions, and then logic is proven and unquestioned, it's facts. If we look back at one of the speeches we looked at, say, um, even just this previous one of, of uh, Brutus convincing the senators, what is he employing there? Ethos, pathos, logos are a combination of them. Well, he's employing a combination of them. And especially the emotion. I know that he's, uh, pathos is really about stroking that ego. And so um, definitely would be emotion. And he's going to rely on logic, but it's kind of a faulty logic later on. 
and we'll take a look at that in just a minute. But, um, and I think even ethos, I'm wondering if he's using his own ethos here. You know, Cassius has already told him how the others look up to him. So maybe he's using his own authority to kind of push this forward. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, so what we've done, Mr. Short recorded a, um, a kind of the techniques in how you pull out the evidence. So we're not going to play that for you right now. We just ask that you do play it when you get to this slide in the presentation. Um, so he will show you, you know, what how the different lines translate into ethos, pathos, and logos. So be sure to take a look at that. Is there anything that you wanted to mention more about this video? I know it's been a year since you recorded it, so <laughs> I don't know if... I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and it's very good. I, I reviewed it. So just make sure that you take a look at that video. So here are your possible choices. And if there's something else that you think might make a better analysis, just email whoever your teacher is and say, hey, I would like to do this one instead, and we'll take a look and make sure. Um, it needs to be a speech where there's persuasion going on. But any one of these, um, we looked at Cassie's speech to Casca. Brutus's speech to Lucius is, that one is a really interesting one because he's really convincing himself. In fact, you know, um, he at some point, Lucius isn't even really in the room and he's still trying to talk to Lucius. Um, Decius's dialogue with Caesar, um, speak, Caesar's speech to Simber, uh, Brutus's funeral speech and Anthony's funeral speech. Those two are really interesting. Mark Antony's especially. I'm pretty sure that's the one everybody goes to because everybody has, you know, that's the one that starts friends, Roman countrymen, lend me your ears. When you analyze it, you do want to analyze the whole speech and you don't want to pull from more than one. So whichever one you choose, toss the rest aside. There should be no references except maybe in a summary format of what will happen later. Just stick with a single speech. Okay. Um, we also looked at, this was from last semester, but I wanted to include it again because I know we have new students in our classes this semester. So the organization of a paragraph, you're going to look at what the goal of the speaker was. Uh, Brutus wants to convince the, the councilman that Caesar must be taken out for the good of Rome. Then what does the speaker say? What is the appeal and how does it work on that audience? What other evidence supports that appeal? And then you have a concluding sentence. So here is a sample that I put together. Um, this one comes uh, for I think this is the Lucius one. So Brutus manages to convince himself that Caesar must be killed for the good of Rome, even though he has no solid proof that Caesar even wants to be emperor. As he is contemplating this act of treason, he begins with, it must be by his death, and for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him. Notice how I've cited this. The first is the Roman number, the Roman numerals for the act, Roman numeral for the scene, and then the line numbers. That's how you so cite anything in this. The word personal seems to be a way for him to justify that this is not about his own ego, which Cassius appealed to earlier. Then Brutus compares Caesar to someone of low standing who climbs ambition's ladder, reaches the top rung, and then turns his back on those below. Ironically, Caesar has never given Brutus cause to believe this is part of his leadership, but still Brutus justifies the action by saying, but tis a common proof, meaning everyone does it, so why not Caesar? Because he has made up the whole scenario about what Caesar might do, he convinces himself that this is something Caesar will do. Perhaps his ego has gotten the better of Brutus, which is why he is so easily swayed to believe killing Caesar is necessary. So break this down. The first sentence is the claim. This is what he's, the audience is himself. 
his message is that Caesar must be killed. Then there's a piece of evidence from the play, an explanation of how that shows this is how he's convincing him. Then I do it again. There's a second chunk, another um, piece of evidence. This one's not necessarily a big quote. Well, this one down here is. Um, you can take little pieces like this. That Sometimes that's better. Try not to copy more than three lines at a time in anything that you use. Just find what's the most important part of that. And then another warrant explanation as to why this shows this up at the top and then a concluding sentence. I know this looks long. I know it looks complicated and you're sitting there probably thinking, I don't write like that. We're just showing you what a model looks like and we want you to try and get as close as you can to it. Do you have any other advice on how to put these paragraphs together, Mr. Short? Anything else you want to add to that? No, I think you covered everything very well, Mrs. Campbell. Okay. So the essay should be in MLA format. Um, we want you to start practicing this because it's got to become second nature to you later. Remember that if you go to Google Docs and you click in the actual Docs app and they give you the templates, one of the first templates should say report MLA. Use that. That's all you need. Uh, and because you don't need a work cited on this, you can just delete that last page. But all that formatting will be done for you. You do need an introduction with the major claim. What is the goal of the speaker? Those paragraphs that you just saw, you need two of these. Whoops. So um, it can it should still be about the same speech but maybe one could be about you know this is the message and this is how it's working the other one could be here's how it works on the audience that it's supposed to be working on and then a conclusion that restates the major claim so technically what we're looking at here is four paragraphs Two of the, the two body paragraphs are going to be kind of big, but the introduction and the conclusion do not have to be that big. Here are the due dates to avoid getting deductions. So we would like you to have the first draft turned in by Wednesday, February 26 at 11.59 p.m. Because the very next minute, that's when um, Canvas is going to send out the peer reviews. So when you wake up Thursday morning, that peer review should be there. And then the peer reviews are due February 28th at 11.59. The reason we want that is uh, both Mr. Short and I need to get some grading done for, for you guys. But this also gives you guys a chance to look at how did somebody else approach this task. So they will be expecting to see something from you after the 28th. Okay. So if you have questions, make sure that you email your teacher. Now, um, Mr. Short, I will be gone all next week. So I hope you don't mind. I included the phone number for your for your line so that if any of my students have a question, would they be able to call and ask you for advice on what to do? Oh, sure. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. So yeah. anything you want to add to this before we close up? Just try to have fun with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is, this is, you know, I used to object to Julius Caesar. I thought, no, I don't want to teach this. But, you know, I've really gotten to appreciate this play because of just how the way people manipulate each other. And this is still something we deal with today. So it is a good play. Well, thank you, Mr. Short, for joining me in this little podcast, and uh, be sure to um, uh, meet those due dates. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Campbell. Okay, All right. Bye-bye.